All right, ES6 and uh, classes. So we're going to talk a little bit about JavaScript and some of the um, some of the features that were introduced in ES6. I mean, now we're we're about uh, ES8 now, but uh, this was a very big release, and one of the main features in there was uh, ES6 classes. So let's take a look at that. So quickly, we're going to look at uh, ECMA, what ECMA script is, is a review, and I'm going to quickly look at ES6 classes, subclassing, super. Actually, we're not talking about setter and getter anymore. I have to update that. That was on objects. We're not dealing, we're dealing with classes and static methods. All right, so just a review, ECMA International. So JavaScript, what it is, high-level, dynamic, untyped, interpreted language for browsers. And really what we want to understand is where this, there's an organization called ECMA Inter International. They basically decide what the standard is. And then we often hear ECMAScript right is is the specification we sometimes call it es6 ecmascript 6 so we always say es uh es uh, 2015 or es6 but now it's actually the latest one is es 2017 which is es8 with some features you know not too not too many i mean there are additional features but the big the big release was at es6 right so there's iterations and the newest one is es8 but nothing really totally groundbreaking just you know different different versioning so when I think of the uh, the guy sitting around ECMA International trying to figure out the schema for JavaScript, I like to think that you know they're all sitting around a table and they're all deciding maybe like these guys some very important important things that that need to to be released and they may have disagreements and whatnot. Hopefully peacefully, and they decide what version of the world is gonna is going to see what the next iteration is going to be. Right, so. One of the things with ES6, what they did with classes, if you, is if you don't, if you didn't know, if you're using vanilla JavaScript in the past, um, they had something called the prototype chain, and that's how natively native uh, vanilla JavaScript deals with inheritance, right? It's not true inheritance. Uh, it's it's basically called the prototype chain. Some definition here bef before I give you a, a graphic to put on the place. You know, when it comes to inheritance. JavaScript only has one construct with objects, right? I mean, they have functions, but they have objects. And each property holds a link to another property, and it's called the prototype. So there's basically a link. That's what's called part of the chain. So the chain, well, the prototype object has its own prototype of its own, and so on. So the chain keeps going and going and going and going until finally it hits, it hits a null, meaning there's no, more, there's no more links. That's the final link. And that what's determined or ends the prototype chain. And you can add on to that chain. So when we when we talk about things like array and we had array dot map and we say okay well array dot proto proto dot map basically you have the array object that's been around for a while it had a prototype and somebody attached onto it all these array functions like filter reduce map all these things right are now attached onto that onto that are linked are linked now to that main object so. That's when we talk about proto and what the, that's what it is. We're, we're referring to the chain. And it's confusing. It is. And, and some people say it's the greatest weakness. But in a way, it's, it's more powerful than the other, the other model because you can, you can add as many links as you want. And then you can bind things and delete links and all these kind of things. But if you want to visualize it, because it is confusing, to be honest, it's very confusing. But if you look at it in a way, it's this chain here. It's, it's going up, right? You have the object. You have a property, you have the prototype, you have another property, and then you keep going down the chain and keep adding properties. So when you have that whole container, that whole object, it has all the properties, right? So if you look at on the right, there's a person function, which is encapsulated in an object. And then on its prototype, you go and you overwrite the name. You, you basically you add a function, say prototype.name equals now you're adding. So you had first and last name, now you're adding a uh, an attribute called name that if somebody calls it is going to combine both first name and last name but at the top level the original one didn't have that property so it allows things to be added to it as you go so what because it is confusing and uh, and you know it, basically ES6 is syntactic sugar all this stuff anyways uh, they added something called classes and we'll take a look at that in a second All right, all right. Classes. We take a look at classes. So, JavaScript classes introduce. They introduce something called ECMAScript. And again, ES6 is syntactic sugar. All this stuff because it, it is the existing prototype based inheritance. It'll translate down when it decompiles down into that, anyways. But you know, to us, we are we believe we are doing JavaScript. 
we uh, we we feel we're doing we are doing JavaScript we, object oriented programming from C sharp and Java background it's very familiar to us so we feel great about it and, and that's basically allowing us to work in that same model so it doesn't introduce any new object oriented inheritance it just uh, it just allows us to work in that object oriented mindset so on the left you have a, a class declaration you say class rectangle with a constructor to me that already feels like something like C sharp, it already feels like Java. And then you have the expression, which is just assigning. We had functional expressions, now we have class expressions. You can add a variable and assign it to a class. And one thing to note is function declarations are hoisted, class declarations are not. What that means is hoisting means it puts it up to the top. Sometimes in the execution, uh, it can throw functions way at the top and mess up your, your global namespace somehow. Sometimes, but classes stay where they are. They don't get thrown up to the top when it compiles. Uh, subclassing with extends, so this is really great. So if you if you understand uh, inheritance, basically this is taken from the base class. So extends, the keyword allows you to create a class and then subclass it. So if you have on the left, you have a base, a super, a super class called animal with a constructor and it has a method called speak. Uh, now you can have, you can extend it with a child, a subclass called dog and basically you extend the super class, so now you're inheriting from the super class. This is a derived class, and it has a constructor uh, called the super, and uh, then you have its own version of speak. So if you, if you actually, in, if you're new to object-oriented programming, uh, you're basically there's a concept called overriding. So in this dog method, we're overriding, we're overriding the anim the animal, the the super class one because we have had the method over uh, with the same signature. If that makes any sense. If we didn't have that, we would have we would we would have the we would inherit from the super the parent. We'd be able to use the parent, which would say this name makes a noise. This dog makes a noise, right? Here you can see on the bottom there when it creates uh, when it creates that instantiation, it actually will take the one on the left. It'll say this name Mitzi barks. It won't take the other one. All right, a little demo on right? so, IO and uh, so now I'm getting overwritten. Hold Node on for a second. And using I'm getting over. I'm getting overwritten by one videos. I'm doing a bunch here, and they're overwriting. So that was loaded in the background. And it came back on. I was talking with myself. I'm not cutting that out because I I don't have time to to do editing here. So we're just gonna go with that and just say that uh, that was some somebody else talking. <laughs> I was trying to wrap this up so I could stop that. But anyhow, so so I was trying to get back to this. Was saying um, yeah. So if you have the concept of a parent object, and then you derive it with a child object. You have uh, you basically inherit everything from the parent, and you can also add to you can add more like you're extending, you're adding more, so you have a copy of something, and then you're adding to it. But you can also overwrite things from the the parent, right? You can you can overwrite the behavior that would be expected from somebody that actually had made that copy or d derived. Uh, you may you may actually put its own the, the behavior we would want that new object to have. You may want to keep some of the original base or super or parent behavior, but again, you may want to do, you may want to inherit everything, or you may want to do some, you may want to mix, mix, mix and match, maybe make its own specific behavior. All right, going on with that. So super, when we say super, super class calls with super, the super keyword is used to correspond to the super class, which is like a parent class, which is in some languages called a base class. This is one advantage over a prototype inheritance is that you can actually refer back very easily to its parent and its parent. So another, so so again, same kind of example we have on the right. We have something called cat. That's the super class. It has a constructor that that you pass in called name, and then you can set that in the constructor. So if you don't know, the constructor gets called when the when the ob, the class is instantiated into an object. So on first instantiation, that's when the constructor gets called. It's like the setup. Passing the name, you set things up, and it's invoked right away. On that super class, we have some a method called speak. Uh, <clears throat> let me use my laser pointer. Why not? All right. So this constructor here is what I'm talking about. And when it gets instantiated, it has this name that, and this keyword is internal to this instance of the the object, the class, right? So this is only internal to this object. Inside of this, we have a method called speak, which is internal to this until it gets invoked. And you can see here, this dot name makes a noise. So in the subclass, we have lion extends the keyword cat. So now we're deriving from the superclass. In its 
So it doesn't have a constructor, but it should maybe. Best practice would say constructor and then you call the super, but this one doesn't. But anyhow, it's overwriting the default behavior and it has its own version of it, but there's a way of actually calling the base class, which is called super.speak. So now we're actually gonna call this one and then we're gonna actually add to it. So we're gonna add, the result would be, as you can see down there on the output, it would say, let L equal to new lion, fuzzy is the name. And then it's saying L.speak. And then you can see it's, it's actually triggering both of those because we've overwritten it now. The default behavior would just say, makes a noise, but now we've actually added to it. So the behavior now is different. All right, so then we have just one last thing, last slide, I'll show, a, I'll show a little bit of an example. So just a static keyword. If you know what static is, basically it's a static method. These are used for like, these are not, you don't need to instantiate these kind of classes. With a static method, a static, static call, like right here, you can tell the static method with, sorry, the class with static methods doesn't have to be instantiated. You can just call it right away. It, it, it's, it's a static function. As you can tell here, you don't have to new it up, as you would say. You can actually just call it. So these kind of things are very good for like uh, classes that or objects that need to remain in memory that may not change very often in your application, something like logging or some kind of utility function like string utility or some kind of thing, you know, I don't know, like some kind of cleanup or something like that that is always there. And you know it's not going to change very much and you will always use it. So like a good example is like a like a cross-cutting thing like logging. So everywhere in the application, it would make sense to keep it in the memory because it's going to be used everywhere. So I'm going to quickly load up some code for a second here and just demo something here. All right. So if we have a simple object here, so let me just get rid of this stuff here. And we have a person class inside of this person class. Let me clean this up. We have a constructor and it's very simple, one kind of level object. And we have a constructor. Inside this constructor it gets called on, on in instantiation of the object. We pass a name and object. We set this dot name, which is internal to the object, and this dot age. And then we have a method. And it's public by default, and but it's not invoked until I call it from the outside, so it's internal. And it's just going to simply return, hello, my name is, and then this keyword dot name, and this dot age. So how I would new it up is I would, uh, I would actually create uh, a variable and new up when you new up it says new, that means you're using the new keyword and you're using the object so you create that new instance and then we log that out we should expect when we're calling greet that it's going to return hello my name is sarah all right node person dot js hello my name is sarah i am 28 well hello sarah so now if we did not set this so if we did not actually set we provided this um information to the constructor but we did not set those things so we could expect it to be empty so now you'll see it's undefined right because it, it wasn't set and there's a couple ways of doing that now like you could actually say uh let's see here i think you could do so you may need to do this you could do something like this normally if you have it exposed you could say name equals to mike you could say age equals to 29 let's say 25 right let's say why not <laughs> it's been a while so say how many is mike i'm 25 all right so so that so you can call it from the outside and you could actually call you can call it directly or you can pass it internally to the constructor and that's how you could set that up so that is a flat class in the next one i'm gonna say I'm going to I'm going to instantiate this is my base class now. I want to extend it and I want to create a customer, but I don't want to have to set the name and age again. And I don't want to have to set the greet again. I want to reuse that stuff. That's why I would extend it. I would reuse it. A, a customer is still a person, but maybe he has a couple more business specific behavior in that object. So that's why you would why you would do object oriented programming for reusability, for composition these kind of things and, and basically create a hierarchy of objects that can be can be reused and and uh, you know that's how you build an application right compared to say something like COBOL where all you have is uh, you have lines and lines of code and go to procedures where you have to it's not very maintainable and you can in fact you could have millions and millions of lines of code 
So anyhow, we have this uh, person, we have this subclass here, so customer is a person. So what I did is now, again, some specific business application is a balance, right? So you could have a balance, maybe you have a bank account. But name and age, we need to pass it up to person, so we use super.name and age, which calls this constructor, so this gets all set up in the parent class, and then in the specific customer class, we set the balance. That's it. And then what's different is we, we don't override greet, but in fact, we have a new method called info. It's saying this, this is my name and I owe this amount. So if we instantiate it, we pass in the same amount. Uh, so the same way we new up customer, which we could also new up suit a person, but it would not have the balance. And we pass in the name, the age and the amount owing, and then we console log it. So if we were to say, Customer.js. All right, Kevin owes me $300. Well, Kevin, you better pay up because you better have my money, right? So, in fact, if somebody owes you money right now, I'm sure they're home, to be honest. I'm sure if you go there right now, knock on their door, I'm sure in this 2020, they're home. They're not going anywhere. So you could probably, in fact, get your money because you know they're not gonna they're not gonna run out, right? They're they're gonna be there. There's no there's no excuse now that they're gonna say I'm not I wasn't at home or I missed your call, because you know where they are, all right? So, so anyhow, that, that's the point there. I mean, you could uh, you could do more with this, obviously. You could extend it again and say, you know, customer now, I'm a bank customer or whatnot, and you could keep deriving down and keep calling up. And it's all about reusability. Again, this is syntactic sugar for you. Six, what this all does is it all translates down anyway, so that prototype inheritance chain functions, and it looks like a mess, and you only want to see it. You just want to sit here and feel like you're doing object-oriented programming when, in fact, we're doing JavaScript, right? So we looked at uh, we looked at ES6 classes, and we're going to move on to promises in a little bit. All right.